YouTube show. Uh, and he makes a lot of money off of it. But there was this cool thing that I read about that he actually took some of his money. He had a homeboy who was in recovery mm-hmm. and his homeboy wrote a book. So he actually paid, I don't know how much money it was, but he bought a billboard like downtown Hollywood to promote his buddy's sober book. It's crazy how many Pretty people cool. hate people with money, but then people with money are the ones helping people. The irony. Yeah, man, I try not to think about it so much. All I know is I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I don't understand. You. I, doing the, even starting this podcast and everything. Well, I mean, it, it, it still makes me nervous talking in front of people. That's why I stop. It looks like I'm trying to burp or something. I'm just trying to catch my <laughs> breath. Because, I, I mean, my, heart, that, my heart's about to pop every that. time. I noticed that. I mean, every uh, once in a while, I want to tell you just to slow down. Yeah, my, yeah, my head just starts brain. rushing, everything, you know, I get Why really is nervous. that? I, um, I have Asperger's. Um, I mean, I know. You should tell yeah. them. Oh, I have Asperger's. <laughs> um, you know, people just say I tend to look like I have a stick up my ass all the time. Or a nightstick. Um, yeah, a nightstick. <laughs> people, I was like, oh, yeah, you seem like a cop. I'm like, no, I was, I was like this beforehand. It actually helped as a cop, but. So what is Asperger's? Like, I mean. Asperger's is, a, now they don't even call it, they call it high-functioning autism. But when I was diagnosed with it, it was Asperger's. I don't like calling it high-functioning autism because people, there's such a huge array. Um, it's basically where you, it's a communication disorder, mm. uh, but your communication with your like emotions, people assume that people with Asperger's aren't empathetic. It's quite the opposite. Very empathetic. I just don't know how to relate. I don't know how to, um, I didn't, I didn't laugh my first time until I met my daughter. I mean, I, I just didn't, it, nothing was natural laughing. When people tell jokes, I don't usually laugh, you know, that's why I look like I'm mad at everything. Mm-hmm. But, um, it, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's oversimplifying and everything. There's, it's a lot of things. Usually when you have Asperger's, you have other things. It's like an emotional thing, right? It's like uh, sort of express emotions. It, it's exp- expressing know. emotions, um, um, articulating, mm-hmm. um, the way you feel, um, showing it. Uh, but also there's, I mean, typically when people with Asperger's have, you know, ADD, stuff like that, you know. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of monotone. If you would have met me 15 years ago, you wouldn't have recognized me. Um, when I had, I'd got diagnosed when I was an adult, um, it was after my first wife and I, well, I was going through that and I just couldn't, I couldn't understand. I didn't, I'm like, I did everything right. Nobody told me anything. You know, I thought I was doing everything right. So I went and talked to them and then they were talking to me, had me do a few tests and stuff and talk some more. Then I got diagnosed with Asperger's. Well, I think that was the best thing for me, but I think it's horrible to teach kids that they have Asperger's because a lot of people use it as a crutch and they don't, um, I've met a lot of people with Asperger's with autism and I usually can identify them. And most of the time they're, um, they lean on it. They have social phobia. It's, Imagine that you're in a group of people and you're wanting to be a part of them people really bad, but you can't. I mean, you're always separate from everybody. Mm-hmm. You're constantly, you, you never feel that connection. Um, and it, it drives you nuts. I mean, there was a movie, uh, Ben Affleck played in it. The Accountant. Uh, the Accountant. He had Asperger's. Um, you know, there's sensory perception problems, stuff I know, like that. I just watched it the other day. It was oh, a pretty good movie. It's, it's a good movie. It's not for kids, little kids at all. I watched it with my son. Yeah, you would. <laughs> um, I, uh, We're all about people getting shot. Yeah. I, um, on movies, not, I've never shot somebody in real life. I, yeah. I, um, Anyways. But, you know, it, uh, to me, it, it helps a lot because it makes me rational. I don't act out um, in anger. I did when I was a kid because I didn't understand it, but I compartmentalize everything. Mm. Um, And so I'm able to separate uh, my emotion from what's going on. Um, And uh, it looks like I'm being an asshole, but I'm very direct. I'm very, you know, this is, you know, I just reading a script almost. Um, But when I was a cop, it probably helped me out more than anything because I'd see cops. My first um, my first death was a two year old. And I mean, the, the cops would start crying and I didn't quite understand why they were crying, you know? Um, and then my second one was a 17 year old hung himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my last one was a 10 month old 
and I had to give him some CPR and the EMS um, uh, person, he was an older man, couldn't even keep his hands still to do it. But I was able to just, it, it's a job. I was just doing what I'm supposed to do. Now, I don't know if I could do it now that I have a daughter. Um, because whenever I had my daughter, I, I started having emotions that I'd never felt before. I mean, like I'd said before, I'd never known what unconditional love felt like. And so it was, uh, it was different. I mean, you know, just having my, my happiness rely on somebody else. You know, I could always be alone. It didn't bother me. But now I, I can't, I can't be without my daughter every day or any day. Mm -hmm. You know, I even go a few hours and I start missing her. And it's, it's a very strange feeling to me because I'm used to being alone. You know, it's, it, uh, I don't know. Not that I want to stay alone for the rest of my life, but it's what, you know, the cards that were dealt with me, I just always feel alone. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that, sorry, I'm, I just got these contacts in. No, it's, right? Right. it's the first day that I've worn contacts and it's really with me and I'm trying not to. Look like I'm right. touching my face. Contacts were hard when I when I started wearing contacts because I don't like I don't like being touched. Yeah, um, and it was like something was constantly poking me in my eyes and stuff. I went through probably like a dozen different types of contacts before yeah. I found one that would work because my glasses kept getting broke when I was a cop. So yeah. that's so hard to hear you say all the time, man. I was a cop. I was yeah. a cop. <laughs> it's, it started to get weird for me because it's I mean it's been a few years. Yeah, but. Um, no, so that I, that Asperger's man, like I mean, would that would that like how that you mentally? I keep telling myself I won't go and cut. That's like, right. Like um, like as a cop, right? Because I don't, I don't know. Man, I don't just don't know a whole lot. Because all I know is like the Asperger's that I seen on like movies, you know, yeah. uh, like the movies talking about. But there, there's, a, have you ever seen The Chosen? Yeah, it's a TV series. Yeah. So if people don't Matthew. know, the, yeah, it, the, Matthew has autism. Yeah, right? he's autistic. Right. And he just has this where he's, he really finds it hard to channel emotions and like he just doesn't get it. And, you know, like so I don't really understand it, man, but I, it's got to take a toll like mentally, I guess. It, um, if I wouldn't have learned to adapt. See, the thing about people with Asperger's is a lot of people think they're unintelligent because they're not able to people judge your intelligence mostly by communication. Mm -hmm. If you're not able to communicate and articulate your words properly, people think you're dumb. And there are people that can word really well, you know, they do good at the talk, but, um, but they're dumb, you know, and people think they're smart. Uh, Asperger's, it's one of them, you know, they'll, uh, when I became a salesman, um, luckily my boss, um, actually, um, he has a degree in psychology and he recognized it and, uh, we broke, broke up in teams and he always made sure I was on his team because he knew he had to word it a certain way for me to understand it because things that are common sense to some people or most people, I see it differently. You know, you've heard of the inside the box thinker or the outside the box thinker. I didn't see a box, you know, it's just, everything was new to me. I had to learn. That's why when I became a cop. I, I focus on behavioral analysis and interrogation, interviewing, you know, uh, because I wanted to be able to look at people and know what they're thinking, knowing how they're feeling, because my facial expression doesn't really change. You know, I've, but I've learned to adapt it uh, quite literally, as stupid as it sounds, looking in a mirror, mm -hmm. trying to learn how to smile properly and stuff. Um, my, um, I had a cousin tell me that, uh, that um, well, she said she was my cousin. But um, tell me that uh, when I was smiling in a picture once, I was really trying to smile for this, my first picture with me and my wife and my son. She said, you look constipated. I was like, I was smiling. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, it, it, it sucks because it's boring. I, like when I first tried to start doing this podcast, I mean, it, it, it took me six months of trying to get myself to get in front of the camera to talk because I'd get in front of the camera and I'm just like, this is stupid. I'm talking to a machine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but then when I finally recorded it, I'm like, I am boring. I, mm -hmm. I get bored listening to myself. I have to have somebody to bounce off of. I don't. I doubt that. I've heard you talk forever and ever well, and see, ever and ever. That, that's funny. You can stand in front of me and all you have to do is be in front of me and I, I can see you talking to me. And so I, I'm having a conversation with you, yeah. but I don't talk to myself because it doesn't make any sense. There's yeah. nobody there. 
Yeah, I know, dude. I'm going through kind of. I mean, I guess it's similar like that for a lot of people because I'm I'm shooting these little sermon segments that I'm trying to piece together, uh, and it's I'm sitting down and I have like my laptop out and then there's a camera like this camera set up right here, yeah. and I have my notes in front of me. It's just hard for me to try to articulate or you know the, the what I, what I'm trying to say because it sounds great in here, right? But yeah. from here to here. And it's just weird when I'm the only one uh, and, and I'm recording it. It's, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I guess it takes practice. Like I have to put myself in a frame of mind that either I am talking to somebody or yeah. I just really what it is. I got to let ego go. Yeah. I got to let my ego go and just, you know what? Nobody's trying to figure this thing out, you yeah. know? So. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, You'd ask me what, um, what, you know, how, how it affected me as a cop. What I taught myself by, by, watch, by learning, I first, as soon as I heard about Asperger's and I got diagnosed, I started reading everything I could about it. And what I noticed, everybody was incredibly intelligent. I was like, if they're so intelligent, how come they're, they look like a flipping dork? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they can't. I was like, it doesn't, I was like, but I was doing the same thing. And then I was like, it's adapting. And the thing is, why I said that I don't like it when they, people tell their kids, it's like, I don't like it when people tell their kids they have ADD or ADHD or OCD or anything, you know, it's because it becomes a crutch and they stay like that. And I didn't want to stay like that. I wanted so bad to be a part. I mean, remember, I grew up alone anyway. So now I'm finding out that, well, you're always going to be this way because of the way your mind works. You're always going to feel like you're alone. And, um, and that's something that's not talked about with Asperger's and stuff is that because you are so different. And I was like, you know, I may not be able to control the way I think or what I feel, but I can control what I say and what I do. And so I forced myself into situations, which I was already doing that. I forced myself into college and everything else. I just didn't understand why I was such an outcast, mm -hmm. you know, um, why I never got invited to the parties and stuff. Everybody loved seeing me there, but I never got invited. Um, it's because I was... I just stood there. I mean, I was having fun. I enjoyed it. But, you know, like I said, I, I had to learn to adapt. And, and if people would learn how to adapt, you know, it, but now we live in a society that you're taught that the world adapts to you. Oh, you have ADD. That's why, you know, it's okay. You know, squirrel, that kind of thing. You know, you have ADHD. It's fine. Oh, oh you're um, bipolar. That's fine. You know. You, um, oh, yeah, my son is a habitual liar. I mean, he is. And he's diagnosed with ADHD. And every single person I've talked to that has a kid and their kid has ADHD, they say, oh, well, he has ADHD. He can't control it. And I'm like, you're really going to teach your kid this? Mm -hmm. You know, I was blessed. I mean, I just, I, I mean, I got in a lot of trouble for having rage because I'd have a lot of rage when I was a kid. Because I didn't understand emotions. And then when noises, loud noises still hurt my ears, um, uh, it, it would go on even if, no matter how I reacted, it would still bother, it still, it still happened. So I learned that, well, you know, well, not the rage, that when I did something about it, I realized that I can't control that, so quit trying to. Yeah. You know, and I, so I just, I would just get away, I'd start breathing, calm down, you know. You know, kept me out of jail. Yeah. See, I like that train of thought. I can't control it. Yeah. You know, as I don't know, control controls an issue for a lot of people. I say, you know what, man? It's really it's it's a problem for me. I'm at, trying to get to a point in my life where I don't give a damn what they like, and really, like, I don't. At some point, I really do give a damn what people think, you know, and that's just being 100% honest, but I'm trying to get to a point where it doesn't affect my mood. Yeah. You know, like if someone says something this or, you know, if I like, I was talking to Mike before this, man, like I, I put a song out and it doesn't do what I want it to do. It, I would really, I would really get bummed. So, but then I realized at some point I was putting my level of success in numbers, uh, into other people, right? If this doesn't get seen by that, 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 that then I will feel like a failure. Yeah. And it's funny because there's no amount of number that you could give me to make me feel like I'm a fucking successful person. It has to come from within. Yeah. So then I got to a point where, like, so I put music out on Spotify and I put music out on this and they have an app that goes with it. So if you have a, you have a Spotify playlist and you, 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 you're an artist and you have, like, you can string your own songs. You can find it or Frank you Thompson. You can get... Uh, Thomas, Frank. Uh, yeah, you can find it on my... 
fucking, you know what I'm saying? It's out there. I'm not really big on, like, when I, when I grab this concept that I don't need to promote my shit 100% of the time, I stopped, right? Because, I don't know, man, I don't really know how to explain it other than the fact that I'm just a faith, you know what I'm saying? And I, faith filled, <laughs> I should say. Yeah. Uh, because, bro, I believe everything for me is on faith. Quick story, how I met my brother, Hard Target, the guy I sent you yeah, the song, yeah. right? I saw his yeah. interesting video. Hard Target makes a living off of music, yeah. right? I met him. I don't know if I've told this story on here or not, but I met him because I did a show in Tulsa for eight people. It seemed like there was eight people there, yeah, but right? There was, it wasn't a big show. There was a, it was a local show. And it was crazy because one of the guys in the crowd was somebody I didn't know. You know what I'm saying? He he was somebody, uh, honestly, he had he had a bud farm. And but he had some people, like some people who were known, shoot a video at his farm. So when he seen me do my set, he was like, yo, I know so and so and so. And when they come into town, I'm gonna mention your name because he liked the set that I put on. Right. Yeah. And that's why I perform, I don't care if it's for eight people, 18 people, 80 people, whatever. Uh when I perform, I get my mind focused on God and I'm like, you know what? Just help me get through this and just have fun doing it. And that's what I did. And there wasn't a lot of people there. But like I said, somebody was there who knew somebody. And he tells me this and he was like, oh, when so-and-so, it was big, my homeboy, Big Buzz. He was like, Big Buzz is going to come to town. And when he does, I'm going to have you on his show. I was like, that's cool. I hear it a lot. Right? I hear people, oh, we're going to get you hooked up. Da -da 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 -da. So I was like, you know what, man? That's cool. Anyways, that was, that was, I'm going to say it was in like February or March when we did that show. And between there and I think September, there was a period where God was telling me, I felt God was telling me to get off social media. Yeah. And my, all, always my thing is, well, I need to promote my music. I need to make sure this gets shared. So I have to keep social media. But also there was girls, there was lies, there was a bunch of stuff that I was like, I wasn't using social media strictly for my music, right? I was yeah. only saying that was the reason I couldn't get rid of it. I felt God calling me and he said, trust me. So I did. I, I, I did away with my Facebook for a little bit. I did away with the Instagram. And I mean, like, took it all the way off. Didn't have it on the app, phone, nothing. Didn't, I didn't care. And I, I had to choose every day to ignore it. And at some point in time, them choices became a habit to where I just didn't care about Facebook. So then like, like five months goes by, no social media, no music promotion, no nothing, no nothing. Homeboy who's seen the show, I gave him my number, right? He didn't even have me on social media. I gave him my number and he calls me like four months down the road and was like, hey, dude's coming to town, only he's going to Arkansas. Do you want to go? And it just hit me because I was like, yo, he actually remembered me. And I was like, yeah, I want to go. And he was like, Meet me here. I'm gonna. You're gonna get on the van. We're gonna pick these guys up from the airport, and you're gonna drive into uh, Arkansas. Is where we went and played in Arkansas. Anyways, like next thing you know, I'm on the bus, right? And you might not know who these guys are, but I I know who they are, and a lot of people know who they are. Uh, there was Big Buzz, uh, my boy Hard Target, Brad Windeville, and a dude named Cryptic Wisdom, right? Cryptic Wisdom's out of Arizona. Does any of them uh, actually have real names? I mean, I don't know. That's just their artist names, bro. You know, I'm just saying like, like if you look up Cryptic, he's been doing things for me. And actually, I have a song called Seven Years Old that, that someone sent me and was like, I challenge you to try to do this. So I, I did it off of a Cryptic Wisdom video yeah. I seen. And so many years later, I'm sitting on this bus, right? I'm sitting in this van. I'm sitting in the back on a cinder block driving to Arkansas. Nobody knows me. Nobody's heard my music. Nobody even knew I made music until we get into Arkansas. And they were like, yo, so how did you get on the van with us? You know, because these are like, they came from Florida, Arizona, and oh man, I can't remember where Buzz is from. Virginia, yeah. right? And these guys all flew to Tulsa to go do a show in Arkansas. And I'm from Tulsa. And they were like, just jump on the van. And like, so they didn't know. And it was funny because like, that's, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story was, I trusted God with that period of, I'm going to trust you with this music. Cause I was still making music. You know, I still do. I just don't promote it all the time. Right. Cause if people are going to hear it, they're going to hear it. And if they're not, then they won't. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all. 
right? All I know is I got to go to Florida to shoot a video and kick it with my homeboy for a week, which I'm going again pretty soon to go shoot another video and kick it with my homeboy. God's opened doors for me in places when I just finally said, you know what, dude, I trust you with this. I trust you with the results. I'm just going to put the work in. I don't know how we got on that conversation, but I mean, that was a cool story. It was nice to reminisce on. Because I've been story. having a pretty shit day. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I know. it was a great day. I took my son to get his hair cut. But yesterday was kind of, it was, yesterday was a blessing. I mean, it was kind of rough. You've had worse days. True that. And you know what? I am 100% for bad days. Yeah. I, um, the, I, what I was thinking when you were saying that was that um, I, I think about mental health a lot because I know a lot of people that have that problem. There's a lot of, there's, Oh, somewhere the, the statistics vary depending on if you're talking about a jail, a state pen, fed, stuff like that. But um, over 50% of the males in jail and prisons um, have some type of mental, mental illness. Um, even more, 60 to 70% of women do. Uh, and a lot of it, I think, is exactly what you just said without knowing you said it. Um, one is their um, foundation principles what the way their mind thinks the perception of reality what's going on they um they want you know uh all it's like this i used to say all the time that i hated people but yeah you know I'd, in fact i'd say it like uh to me people were like having that mangy dog that comes over to your house and you feed it mm. you want to take care of it you just don't want to touch it or be around it that was it but what i've since learned is it wasn't people that I didn't like. It was my expectation of people. And that's what unhappiness is. It's just some, it's your reality is not meeting your expectation. Mm. And so if you learn to have faith, which means let go, you're you just let go, just do what you can. If, if, you know, you take accountability, you're 5% of the problem and they're 95, you take care of your 5%. Mm. That's it. I mean, just do you. Don't worry about it. Dude, that's funny. I'm going to pick your mind right there. What do you What do you mean by learn to have faith? How do you learn to have faith? That's, that's I love this question. I, I had I'm to. Gonna see what, um, I'm going to see what you're talking about, where you're coming at. Remember, yeah. I wasn't raised around religion uh -huh. or Christianity, but I had absolutely zero faith in man. None. Yeah. I'm like, how in the hell am I supposed to have faith in something I cannot see? And, but I, but I'm supposed to have faith that, they're, that, that it's going to work out. His so, coffee cup is way cooler than mine. I just yeah. <laughs> so I um I had to um uh, I had to man you got me off track. Faith. Um. In man. Sorry. Um. <sighs> duck. <laughs> My bad. Now people can see what happens when you have yeah, Asperger's bad, and you're interrupted yeah. like that. <laughs> I, um, I'm man. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I uh. Faith. You said you you had to learn how to have faith. Uh, in something how, you couldn't how, see. How can you have faith in something that you don't see? And I was, I've always, and, and I started, I, I go back and thinking about my past because their past is very helpful. We shouldn't live there. We should learn there. You know, um, I noticed that I'm, I've survived everything. Everything I've gone through ended up good. Bad things ended up something good came out of it. I'm like, if I would have just had faith that God was going to make that happen, I wouldn't have stressed so much. I wouldn't have freaked out so much. I wouldn't have been so miserable. But see, I didn't believe in, in, in Jesus. I believed in God, but not a God that does stuff, just a God that's there. Um, because people kept telling me I wasn't good enough. Um, not in them exact words. They were just saying, oh, you had to change this, you had to do that, you had to do this. And so I never got that opportunity to know that God was actually working on my life. And so having faith, learning to have faith, um, when I took a break out of, when my second wife left me, I took a break from law enforcement, scared to death of heights, absolutely scared to death of heights. I was. I took a job as a cell tower climber climbing 400 feet up in the air on this little bitty tower with mostly ex-convicts that hated the police. Yeah, to throw you off. Yeah, no, I was up there. I was, um, I, I, no, seriously, I was up there and uh, my um, supervisor was a dipshit and told this crew that wasn't a part of our crew that um, I was a cop 
we're up on top. We're at about 350, 375 feet up in the air at the top. It wasn't a tall tower, but it was still tall. I mean, that's 30 stories, 35 stories. He looks at me. He said, so you're a cop. I said, well, I was. He said, what's going to stop me from cutting your lanyard right now? And I looked at him. And I said, you'll go with me. I mean, you know, it's, it sucked, but I learned to be, not be scared of heights because I did it. I forced myself through. Learning to have faith is you're scared, everything else, but anytime your thought starts drifting to that negative place, you're like, nope, I let go of that. Just, it's constant. It's a, it, it, it's a constant mental game till, till you get to the point where you learn. It, 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 doing repetition so much that pretty soon you're only doing that every 15 minutes versus every five. Mm -hmm. Then it's only every couple hours, then maybe a day. Then every once in a while you have to remind yourself it's in God's hands. You know, you just do what you can control. And your perception, you know, I, everything's a lesson to me. I don't get depressed about situations. I, I, I start getting depressed. Then I think, I learned, I think about my past. What lessons come from the past? How can I fix my life from that? What, what came out of it? What am I going to learn from it? Well, then it gets to the point where you know that. So that means the situation you're in now, in the future, you're going to look back and see what lesson you learned. Why not do that now? What lesson am I learning? What are you trying to teach me, God? You know? And life becomes easier. So when was the last time you actually had to like, because faith, I believe, is something that, that for me is it takes not so much practice. Uh, it has to be practice. It has to be practiced by what you're saying with letting go. Um, but for me, faith is, is, is divine persuasion, right? Yeah. Faith is my response to God initiating something, right? Because in order for me, in order for me to have the faith that God's going to get me through something, like you said, he would have already gotten me through something, you know, I'm going to talk about this real quick because this is, this is, this is, for me, this is what faith is. Okay. Remind me, I have okay. a story after you say that though. Remind me. Uh, faith is, for me, is this. It's taking those moments when you want to act in old behavior and not, not acting on it, right? Something we talked about before, we was talking about how it kind of, the scales are unbalanced when it comes to children, fathers. Uh, when in the eyes of the judge. So like I lost my rights to my kids when I went to prison and I got out and I was trying to get them back. And then I relapsed again. So I kind of, I kind of bailed on, on that anyway. So over these past 18, 19 months, I've been working my ass off to, to prove to myself that I'm fit to be a father. Right, not proving to nobody else. I ain't doing shit for my baby mama. I ain't doing nothing for the courts. I'm proving to myself that I can be a father, right? And in doing that, I have my kids all the time. I have, I've had them every other week throughout the summer. My boys love me, they get things from me. I'm actually working, you know? I took them to the, to, I take them to football practices. My son's a quarterback, one's a wide receiver. My, my oldest son's a beast on the field, right? I get to watch my boys play football. I buy them expensive ass shit because they earn it. You know, and because I, I can, you know, these are my children. My oldest son, I've said before, he's my stepson, but I treat him no different than my other kids. But yet I can bust my ass off. And because my kids are technically under the guardianship of their mother, it seems like I'm in a f***ing situation here, right? Not only am I paying child support, taking them every other week throughout the summer, which I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to complain. There's just a situation, bro, because we went to go do the school thing yesterday, right? We're doing the back to school thing. We're doing the child enrollments. We pull up and I have my boys with me and they're showing me the stuff they did in this class, you know, and it was amazing, bro. It's beautiful. I've never, this was the first time ever I've ever walked my kids into a classroom for meet the parents. Yeah. I've never done that because I was always a piece of shit. I was always selfish. I was drinking. I was doing whatever I want. So finding that, right, and, and, and getting to do that, back to the point I was making, faith for me was practice because as we're sitting here filling out paperwork for my kids, enrollments, and their mother's filling it out because technically they live with her, 
She's filling out the line. Mother's name. She writes her name. Father's name. She writes her husband's name. And I'm standing right there. Everything inside of me got so angry, so quick, right? Because I bust my ass off for my kids. I've done it back to back. I've tried everything, you know, and in one moment, the devil can step in and try to sit at my table because now there's a big old ego inflation because these are my children. My name's on their birth certificate. She puts her husband's name. And I got so angry, right? I got so mad. I walked out of the school and I stood in the front, but that would, we still, I still had another son, two more boys that wanted to take me to their classroom. I had to go through this situation three different times. And the only thing I, that could save me in that moment was just saying, God, I'm mad. I'm angry. Help my face not show it. You owned it. I didn't own it, bro. I no, gave it. No, you I surrendered it. You, I gave you it to owned God. The fact how you feel. Because in that moment, it was like, if I don't give it to somebody, I'm going to slap somebody. And then I will be the one in the wrong. If I try to bring it up, I will be the one in the wrong. Yeah. There is no right way to have this conversation. Why? Because legally, she can do whatever she wants to and I get the shaft this this situation I've had people tell me all the time you know that isn't fair I have a homegirl who has child support situations with the next husband and she tells me you know you're right and I'm, I do but if I want to see my children I have to accept it right now and I have to believe that God is going to turn this around because I am there for my boys I, everybody sees the Instagram, the Facebook, the, you know, I only put out what I want people to see. That's fucking social media, yeah. you know, but on the backside of it, there's real struggles going on. And I got to silently live with it because right now there, there's a time and place for everything. And right now is not the time and place to, 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 to try to say something about this. Now down the road, whenever I have a little bit more sobriety in me, right. And I have a little bit more peace and patience. I will sit down with their mother and tell her how it made me feel. But I can't do that right now because the only thing that's going to come out is what I feel and not what I'm trying to get across. And what I feel is anger, jealousy. You know, I mean, 100% honest, dude. I'm mad at myself for not trying to step up and be the man I am now when I had a family. And I get to sit on a football field and watch her have a family. Right, which I would never, you know what? Hey, if that's what's making her happy, by all means, yeah. you know, I do not, I do not wish ill on them at all. Like I wish them, I pray for them. I wish you prosper in your marriage. You guys get everything you want. A trick that I learned, bro, is that when I have an enemy, I pray to God and I believe in God one hundred percent, and I say, God, everything that I want today, give it to them. Yeah. That's 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 how I have to learn. That's how I t treat myself. That's how I put myself in humility. Yeah. Whatever I want. If I'm at you, I'm praying you get the shoes that I want. You get the breakthrough yeah. that I'm asking for. You and I see people that I make music with that I had, you know, like I we had, you know, and I pray for them. People I don't like, I pray you get a breakthrough in a song, homie. I pray your podcast skyrockets. Yeah. God, give it to them. I don't need it. I don't. All I need today is Jesus. Because in that moment when I was so fucking angry, all I had was Jesus. I didn't I care pass. about the shoes that I was wearing. Yeah. I didn't care about the nothing. I didn't care about the car that I was driving, the job that I had. I was so angry. I was about to slap somebody, catch a domestic. And in that moment, all I had was Jesus. And I, that's what it took. I had that's a pastor. real so. faith for me. That's what it takes for me when I'm saying practice based. I'm sorry. I'm hey, I see. I, see. Up, bro. I know. You know, just like I haven't got this out at all. Like I told my homegirl yeah. and I was almost in fucking tears. And she came through with the clutch because as soon as, as soon as she knew that we were going to go do that, right? She kind of knows how my ex is. I've known her for a long time. And she pulled up to my son's school with street tacos. Yeah. 
Like, in, in that moment, bro, like, right as I got so angry, I walked out to school. I was out there for five minutes, and I was on the phone, and I was, like, I was pissed. And she was like, look, I don't want to say that I kind of seen it coming, but I'm almost there with street tacos. And I was like, oh, tacos, bro. I can be pissed with street like, tacos, right? Huh? How can you be pissed when you're eating exactly. street tacos? Exactly. You know? It's something, what you, what you said, and it actually, somebody gave me this advice. Well, I saw it on a video. It was a preacher. Um, and he said this, and it really hit home because I don't understand forgiveness. I, I'd always had a problem with that. And he said, uh, when you're really angry at somebody, pray for them every day. He said, I guarantee you, after 10 days of praying for them, you can't be angry for somebody that you keep praying for. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said. But um, another thing, sorry, my mind was gone while you were talking. You said you didn't own it. We, that you gave it away. Well, you can't give away something unless you own it first. You've got to own the fact that you're angry. You know you're angry. Then you have to surrender it. And see, a lot of people don't understand. You, you've heard the faith as a mustard seed. They always say that. Yeah. But what good is a mustard seed if you don't plant it, if you don't do something with it? I mean, it doesn't matter what faith yeah. is if you don't plant it. You're planting it in, you're owning it. Yeah. You're, you're giving it to God. You're realizing that you don't have control over what's going on right now. And everybody, that, that's part of it getting to you. Everybody's telling you that you're getting screwed over. Why do you need to know that? Does it matter? You just do what you can yeah. take care of right now. You know, it's crazy, man, because I was just reading this book, right? And it's called Don't Let the Enemy Sit at Your Table. And, uh, and that was one of the things that he was talking about. He's like, one way you can know the devil's sitting at your table is that when you're going through a situation, right? And he's like, like he's sitting across from you. He's just like, man, I don't think you're gonna make it. You know, yeah. like, I don't know if you, you know, like yeah. uh, it's probably too much workload for you. Or, oh man, she ain't never gonna see it your way. I don't know how you're still in that marriage. I don't think you're gonna make it through this season. Yeah. And you hear stuff like that, right? And you hear it all the time, but how do you know you're listening is when you start repeating it to other people. It's people like, how are you doing? You're like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. You know, I don't know how I'm going to stick this marriage out. I don't know how we're going to go through this doctor's thing. You know, it, like never once in the history of ever has God ever looked at somebody and said, I don't know about this one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, so that's how you know you're listening to the wrong person, right? Because I, I, I find it when I read my word, I swear. Right, because I have to constantly and and put it at the forefront of my mind when I first wake up. God, I need you. I need you because if I go back to me, if I leave myself alone with my thoughts, I'm leaving myself alone with the last guy who tried to kill me. Oh. You know, and I have to be careful. I have to be cautious because quickly we're talking about mental health. I was telling you, I don't understand mental health, bro. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get it on like a scientific or whatever level. All I know is this. When I was a kid, I watched my mom go into one, after my pops left, I watched her go from one abusive boyfriend to another. And we were kind of in shit, shit, shit situations and we're moving here and we're moving here. and we're moving. So a long time ago, when I was a scared kid, I started building up these walls and this persona that I'm going to be a badass. I'm going to be this tough guy. I'm going to, and I will not show fear. I will not. And I stayed it. And every time something would happen, I would ingrain it. I actually, I got caught up with this gun when I was 12 years old, man, that reinforced that thought. And all the times I got in trouble until you know what, I'm a grown ass man sitting in the penitentiary with this same facade. Like I can't let them see I'm scared, but inside, terrified if you ever anybody who's ever been to prison for the first time in oklahoma when they pull up to the uh, a and r you know you're in that's a supermax facility you know you're in the penitentiary you got the, it's exactly what you see on movies razor wire on razor wire walking dogs mirror under the bus and all that man when you pull up there and you're like this is it this is the real this is the real deal i was terrified right are you in in, in a and r they, it doesn't matter. I was in there for uh, uh, possession of a stolen vehicle and some other shit. But when you first go to prison, they pull chains with everybody. You could have killed somebody. You could have touched a child. You could have done whatever. They don't care. They get them all together. They put them all in one place. And then the caseworker sorted out and everybody gets sent to their own individual yards. 
But for those two weeks to a month, you're in 23 hour lockdown with a celly. You don't know what he did. He don't know what you did. This sh- it trips people out, man. And until you, but when I went through that, I remember I, I kept, I told God, this is like right after I, like right after I became a Christian, right? I gave my life to God. I go into this, this cell and it was 23B and C unit. And it was down at the bottom and it was an old A&R. And I remember because I walked in there and somebody before me had taken the, the little bitty half pencils we get yeah. and drew a beautiful mural of Jesus right above an empty rack where I sat and I sat there and I looked at that wall and it was, I mean, it was beautiful. I looked at it and I was like, okay, you here with me then? You know, like I'm with you. And I just, and I learned to just be still and stay in God's presence, yeah. you know, and terrifying, you know, and I, I learned how to suppress emotions. I got to the point where I don't even like if I get jealous, I don't know how to properly feel jealousy because I just turn it into anger. Mm -hmm. If I get sad, I can't properly feel sadness because I just turn it into anger. Anything that's not joy, happiness, sex, anything that's negative to my mind, I turn it into anger because anger is going to get me my way. Or at least it won't get you your way and I can be happy with that, too. That was the men, that's the mentality that I've had to spend so many nights trying to untangle. And I go through situations like I went through yesterday and I turn it straight into anger. And the first thing I said was that's, that's ego right there. That's ego getting to me. Yeah. And he's, cause I'm about to break everything in this school. We figured we ain't finna have a school year, <laughs> yeah. you know, but sorry, I kind of ran it. I had to get a lot of it's all right. Chest. I um, hopefully have time to, um, I, you asked me about faith and uh, I think you're alluding to the first time I ever, ever even actually tried to have faith. It, um, there were, when I left law enforcement, I actually had to live for five months. I lived in Oklahoma while my wife and my son lived in Arkansas because at that moment, they suddenly, my, his dad had suddenly decided that he didn't want us to leave. And they can't, you know, like you're, um, uh, if you have partial custody, you can't take your child to a different state. Um, when we finally got to move to Oklahoma, we actually lived in a friend's house, slept on his floor while my son slept in the room with the dogs on their floor while they're in crates. Um, when we moved, we, and we slowly moved up. We moved up to another friend's house in Tulsa. Um, and we actually had our own room now. Um, and my son slept and they had a daughter about his age. They were young, so it didn't matter. Um, so he'd sleep in their room. Um, when we finally get into our own little bitty house, I mean, it was like 900 square foot house. My, um, my wife ends up pregnant. I didn't think I could have kids. I mean, I'm talking, I've been married twice. I wasn't the safest person. You know, I was 37 years old at the time. And she ends up pregnant and I'm like, what am I going to do? Because we have a combined income of 54,000, which sounded great compared to what I was making as a police officer, but that was in a place that rent was virtually nothing. I mean, the cost of living is so much higher up here. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I'm selling cars and my wife's due dates coming up and she's not going to be able to work for a period of time. You know, and I'm like, how are we going to do this? And they asked me, and she's, ha- she's having to be induced. Um, they asked me, and my boss comes up to me and says, well, how long do you need off? I said, she's being do- induced on Wednesday. I'm off on Wednesdays. I'll just come back to work Thursday. And they looked at me like I was retarded. They said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I got you. I can't miss work. And um, they convinced me to go ahead and take, take a week off, at least a few days, and then you know, we'll, we'll straighten it out and see if I need any more. And that month was actually when I first started tithing because I was against tithing because people say the old covenant says you do this, but you don't have to do it now. Some people say you do it now, you know, to test God. I'm like, you know what, what do I have to lose? You know, um, because I studied other things, you know, law of attraction says the same thing, you know, you give and you'll receive. 
And so I started tithing that month. I miss a full week. I only worked three weeks. And I actually, only one person sold more cars than me. I sold 19 cars that month and another guy sold 20 cars than that. After that, our combined income was 54,000. After that moment of me fully surrendering to God, I never sold less than 14 cars a month and I averaged making about 8,000 a month versus, you know, I was making 3,000 a month before. Uh, And the very next year, I made almost 80,000 a year, a thousand. So I had, I learned that if you put faith in God, because money, if you want to have faith in somebody, your pocketbook. And I did. And, you know, I quit a job that I was making 80,000 a year to make $15 an hour. And I'm actually in a better, I moved into a bigger house. I'm able to save money for my business all because I give my faith to God, but I had to do something. I can't just look at the mustard seed. I had to plant it. No, that's right. But we uh, went past our time and, you know, Mike's going to end up kicking us out or something. Cussing at us. Refuse to bleep out the Fs. <laughs> so anyways, yep. Share, like, subscribe, hit notify. Anything else? Follow Mike on everything he does because he's yeah. a cool guy, man. Mike at LA Productions. Those, trying to get one of those hats. <laughs> <laughs>